Hello, I am Ivy the Occultist on YouTube and Instagram, and I have been practicing magic in the occult community for the past 15, 20 years. Today, we're gonna to be talking about magical timing. So we're gonna talk about how to better time your spells and rituals for more efficiency. And I've got this video broken up. I'm not quite sure how long this video is going to be because there's gonna be a lot of information. This one's gonna be very information dense. So I will have timestamps down below if you need to jump to a particular topic. We're gonna to be talking about planetary magic today. We're gonna to be talking about moon magic. We're going to be talking about seasonal magic. So if you are interested in any one of those particular things, feel free to skip ahead and listen to that. But before we dive too deep into that, I want to discuss why timing your spell work is important. Because a lot of people, when you first enter the witchcraft community or the occult community in general, timing isn't really something that's often talked about. We're taught how to cast spells and hopefully how to manipulate your own energy and such. But nobody ever really talks about the timing of the spell work. And I feel like that is so so important. It's a conversation that needs to happen more often, but it often doesn't. And it leaves beginners maybe wondering if this is even an important aspect of spell crafting in general. So why is timing important? Some people believe in the power of specific seasons or the power of specific zodiac signs or planetary placements or moon phases. They believe in the energies of these things that can either affect your spell work in a good way or in a bad way. But if you are a more skeptical person and you don't necessarily believe in the energies of the moon affecting us or the planets affecting us, etc., there is another reason for this as well. Many magical practices today, including witchcraft, if you are watching this as a witch, are influenced by hermeticism. There are seven hermetic principles which kind of give a brief explanation as to how magic works, although it's very difficult to prove this is real and it's very controversial and debatable, but I am very much a fan of hermeticism. I do feel like it gives a good explanation potentially to how magic can work. And so within Hermeticism, the second principle is called the principle of correspondence. If you've ever heard of the phrase, as above, so below in the witchcraft community, or as within, so without, that derives from Hermeticism. And with this second principle, the principle of correspondence, this basically says that there is a link between our external reality and our internal reality, between the macrocosm and between the microcosm, between the mind, body and spirit. There are all these links. And that's why we use correspondences in spell work. So if your intention is to cast a spell for peace, love, harmony, or to cast a spell for protection or whatever your spell or ritual is, what you would typically want to do is find items that correspond to that intention. So you want to get some herbs, crystals, trees, plant spirits, deities, and more, you know, times of the day. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later in this video, but you wanna find all these different correspondences that correspond to your intention. And the idea is by manipulating your external environment to match your internal environment, you can then pull those ideas or those intentions out from the internal world into the external world with these physical representations. This also kind of goes into sympathetic magic a little bit, but we're not gonna to dive too deep into the history of that today. But with this principle of correspondence, it's really helpful to have as many things in your spell pertain to your intent as possible. And this also includes the timing. So if you are going to sit down and do a specific spell for protection, let's say, or whatever your intention is, if you can time it in a way that that timing corresponds to protection, the idea is that your spell will be a lot more efficient. Now there's like a huge debate here over how many correspondences you need in a spell and it's really the quality over quantity. Some people like lots of different correspondences. Some people like to work with under five and keep it just really niche. You know, whatever, you gotta play around, be your own scientist and experiment and see what works for you. But this magical timing is super important because it's a really easy way to bring that correspondence into your spell work. One more thing that I did wanna mention is that if if you need to do a spell right now, then you do that spell right now, okay? <laughs> like, yes, it is nice to have the timing that corresponds to the intention of your spell, but there are times where I need something to happen right now and the timing is just not ideal, right? But I'm still gonna do it anyways and I can still do it in a way that's effective. So definitely don't feel like you have to have the absolute perfect timing for all of your spell work. Experiment, figure out what works best for you. I personally love timing my spells, especially 
especially with planetary magic. I am really deep down the rabbit hole with planetary magic, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video. But I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there because you can still practice effective magic and not have the timing right. So don't worry too much if this information is a little bit too daunting for you right now. Come back to it later. Do your spells whenever you need to do your spells. In a perfect world, it would be nice to be able to perfectly time all of our spells, but in reality, that's not often the case. Now let's actually start talking about some timings that you might want to incorporate into your spell work. So we're going to kind of start by talking about the seasons and the wheel of the year. Some people celebrate the wheel of the year, some people don't. I'm not even going to remotely go into the history of the wheel of the year in this video because that is far too long, but the wheel of the year is a concept that derives from Wicca. It encompasses eight ancient pagan festivals. And these eight pagan Sabbaths or festivals mark eight different turning points in the wheel of the year. But even if you don't celebrate the wheel of the year, let's say you just celebrate the seasons local to your area, you can still incorporate this kind of magic as well. So if we're thinking about winter, winter is death. Winter is the time to go into your cocoon. It's not the time to be pushing forward, trying to meet deadlines, trying to manifest. It's not necessarily a great time to manifest because everything's in hibernation. Everything's sleeping. It's time to rest. It's time to recharge, do some self-love, you know, some self-care, maybe some shadow work because we're in the darker half of the season. But really it's a time to just kind of rest, reflect, recharge and all of those things. And then as we head into spring, this is where we start to see new life burst around us. So this is a great time to cast spells that pertain to starting new projects, setting goals and intentions for the rest of the year. It's actually kind of funny because a lot of people set their new year's resolutions like in the dead of winter. And really we might be more successful if we timed it better and did it in springtime rather than doing new year's resolutions in winter time when everything's sleeping and hibernating. It just makes more sense to start new projects in the springtime. When life is starting to come back, we're coming out of our shells again, everything's bursting forth. And then you get to summer, of course, and this is like the pinnacle of energy. This is a great time to manifest things. A lot of people like to do a lot of water magic during the summertime, working with their seashells if you live on the coast. I definitely live close to the coast and I do a lot of my beach uh, sea magic or whatever <laughs> during the summertime. So it definitely just depends on the area that you live in, of course. But it's just a really happy, fun, positive time. It's a time to work with the sun. It's a time to work with the ego and friendships and developing relationships and partying and having a good time. And then we start to slowly descend into fall, which is all about things dying off and being recycled back into the earth. And during fall, this is a time where I personally work with my ancestors. So I do a lot of ancestral magic during the fall time. And this is also just a great time to work with spirits in general. General. So that's kind of just a brief look at the seasons as a whole. Obviously you need to ta tailor it to your own region and what that looks like for you. But within the seasons, I did want to point out that there are two times in the year where the veil is at its thinnest. And what that means is that there is this idea that there is a veil, uh, there is a crossover happening between the living and the dead, between the astral plane and the physical plane. There is this veil and the idea is that it's at its thinnest during during springtime and fall time because these are two transitions points. These can be considered liminal spaces, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video as well. But during the fall time, we have everything that's dying off and being recycled back into the earth. And then during springtime, we have everything being reborn and coming back into the earth and bursting forward. So these two times can be considered liminal spaces, which means the veil is thin. It's a little bit easier to tap into your intuition, your psychic abilities, working with spirits a little bit more. And and then during summertime, we've just got like the pinnacle of energy going on. That's, we're very, very immersed in the physical mundane world. And then wintertime, everything is asleep and in hibernation. If you are a person that experiences a lot of spiritual activity, if you are a person that's very sensitive to that, start keeping track of when that happens. And for a lot of people, they will notice significantly increased spiritual activity during the fall time and during the spring time. So just as a fun experiment for yourself, definitely start to track that and see if it's 
during those two time frames that you experience the most spiritual activity. But as far as spell casting and spell crafting goes, you can also apply this knowledge to the wheel of the year if you decide to celebrate all of the pagan sabbats or maybe only a couple of the pagan sabbats. We have in bulk February 1st and I'm not going to run through all eight in this video otherwise this video would be so long but we have in bulk in February 1st which is the seed of creation. It's where everything is still in the ground but it's just ready to start sprouting out and sprouting up for spring. It's not quite spring yet. Everything is still in the ground and still covered but you've got that seed that's beginning to burst down below the surface. So this is a great time to actually sit down and write out what all of your intentions are and to really kind of figure out what your spell work is going to look like for the springtime. And then we get to Ostara obviously and so on and so forth down the line with the pagan sabbats but we start working into springtime and this is again where things are bursting forth and it's a great time to start manifesting those intentions that you had set at Imbolc. And as I mentioned previously as you get into summer you know you've got Letha coming up. It is that pinnacle of energy that you can harness for manifestation and then we go through the wheel of the year down to Samhain where we're going into fall time again working with the dead, working with spirits, working with ancestors. So you can do this just seasonally in your area and what those seasons look like for you or you can do it through the pagan sabbats. But if you are interested in working with the pagan sabbats I do have some book recommendations here for you. I love this series. It is Llewellyn Sabbat Essentials and each book is a series on or each each book is a pagan sabbat. So it has history, it has activities and crafts, it has spells, it has rituals, food items. I mean, you've got invocations and prayers in here. There's so much for each individual Sabbath. So I love these books, would highly recommend them if you're looking into getting into the pagan Sabbaths and how to use them in your spell work. Because obviously every Sabbath is going to have different correspondences. They're going to be great for different types of spell work. If you are interested in having me do a video on the Wheel of the Year and kind of how all of these eight pagan Sabbaths look, definitely let me know in the comments below. But again, not to be going through all the sabbats in this video otherwise this video is going to be like three hours long so let's move on to the next subject one more thing actually that i wanted to add before we move on because i forgot to put it in this section is that in the idea of seasons you can also have seasons that pertain to specific zodiac signs as well so when the sun is in specific zodiac signs a lot of people like to work with that in their spell work so let's say the sun is in aries aries is the first sign of the zodiac it is considered the newborn child bursting forth with energy and potential. So that is a great time to start new projects, to start pushing forward to the things that you want to start manifesting. Whereas if we work our way all the way around back to Pisces, which is the end of the, the cycle or the, the, the last zodiac sign is what I'm trying to say. This is where we're considering things beyond life. We're considering death. We're considering recycling back into the universe. And there's so much more that goes into Pisces as well. But considering where the sun sign is and what season it is in a zodiac or astrology sense, some people like to practice that way as well and time their spell work for specific zodiac signs. For example, we're going to talk about this when we get to moons here shortly, but I like to do my money bowl on a Capricorn new moon when the sun and the moon are both in Capricorn because that is just a really great sign to work with. If you really want to work with your finances, you want to better your career, you want to be successful, you want to be that boss, you know? I mean, obviously I'm going with Capricorn stereotypes here. I know that there is so much more to Capricorn than that but you get the idea there's certain times of the year with these zodiacs that you can really take advantage of for your working so I always do my money bowl on a Capricorn new moon and it works great for me now let's talk about some moon magic this is probably the most beginner friendly form of magical timing I do see a lot of beginners really kind of falling into moon magic because it's just easy to understand and it also is so effective. <laughs> so let's talk about moon magic and we're just going to briefly go through the moon phases here but we're going to start with the new moon. This is an excellent time for setting intentions, for planting seeds, for kind of it's a clean slate. It is a brand new clean slate. It's a great time for cleansings and just kind of refreshing your space. Not necessarily taking action quite yet but this is the point to start planning, to really start journaling and figuring out what you're going to be doing for this next month. 
And then we get into a waxing moon, which is where this energy is building. So if you have a spell where you want something to increase, working with a waxing moon is a great moon phase to work with. And it's my personal favorite. I know everyone obsesses over full moons, but honestly, waxing moons is where it's at. You've got that building energy. It's constructive. You're moving forward. You're pushing forward and actually taking those intentions that you set at the new moon and putting them to work to achieve your overall goal. It's just this great, wonderful energy for manifestation. And then as we hit the full moon, this is the pinnacle of success. This is a ton of lunar energy to work with. Now for me personally, I actually don't feel very good on full moons. I have a, a thing where for some reason it just makes me feel really nauseous. I'm exhausted. The fatigue is so bad. So I actually don't do any spell work on the full moon because I don't feel good. So you need to listen to your body and figure out what works best for you, of course. I love new moons and waxing moons. Like that's where I feel my best. That's where I can perform my best. So definitely experiment with that and figure out what works. But there's also this time with the full moon where you have this heightened sense of intuition. So yes, a full moon has a ton of extra energy that you can harness, but it's also a great time for divination and doing anything with your psychic abilities and senses. Maybe you wanna start working with spirits a little bit. A full moon is going to really bring out all the weird. <laughs> I, I worked in a hospital for a long time and it was so funny because you always see the strangest freak accidents happen around the full moon and I have I wish I could talk about the full moon so much in this video because there's just so much fascinating research about how the moon phase actually does affect us on a physiological level but I digress the full moon is this heightened state of being psychically, energetically, and it really just kind of frazzles a lot of people out. <laughs> so you can take advantage of it if it makes you feel good, but if it doesn't make you feel good, maybe just, you know, sleep and do some spell work on a waxing moon. Not all magic has to be performed on a full moon. There's this weird thing in the occult community where everyone is so obsessed with a full moon and they think that every spell has to take place on the full moon. That is not necessary at all. And then we move into the waning phase of the moon. So this is where the moonlight is disintegrating and it's starting to trickle down, trickle back to that new moon state. So this is where if you have a spell that you're wanting something to decrease, a waning moon is going to be excellent for that. So anything that involves decreasing energy or decreasing something, getting rid of something, banishings, cleansings, letting go of stuff, the waning moon is excellent for that release and that decrease. And then we get into this last phase called the dark moon. And there's a lot of controversy over this because some people consider the new moon the dark moon, and some people consider like two to three days just right before the new moon to be the dark moon. But the dark moon is essentially a time where it is darkest, right? It's the opposite of a full moon. The dark moon is gonna be a great time for banishings and baneful work. So if you are somebody that's interested in baneful work or if you need to do it for self-defense or something like that, dark moon is gonna be where it's at. It's also great for shadow work. I talked about this in my darkness in magic video, but there's this misconception about darkness where we think that darkness equates to evil and it really doesn't. Yes, you can do baneful magic on a dark moon, but a dark moon can also be really healing and transformative as well if you're using it to do shadow work and to be reflective and to banish things that no longer serve you and to let that shit go. And if we're talking about the timings of dark moon, I like the day just before a new moon. And I know probably astronomically really the new moon should be considered a dark moon, but if I'm going to do some dark moon work, I really like doing it the day before for the new moon because dark moon work can be a little bit heavy sometimes and I like having the new moon be a fresh blank slate. So for example, this is just kind of a general flow that I have when I'm working with lunar magic. But if we're talking about a dark moon and starting on a dark moon, I would do any sort of banishings and letting go that I need to do the day before a new moon. And this is just me personally. You can practice however you want to. But then when a new moon actually comes the next day, I feel like 
it's so much lighter. There is a fresh, clean slate to work with. I can do all my cleansings. I can actually start writing down my intentions and prepare. And in an ideal world, what I would like to do on a new moon is sit down and figure out what type of spell work I'm going to be doing this month. And then I can actually do it during the waxing and full moon phases, depending on you know whatever spell work it is that I'm doing. But I'm writing that stuff down on a new moon and getting a game plan of everything. And then as the waxing moon comes about, this is where I'm going to start doing my spell work to achieve my goals, to achieve whatever intention it is that I have set out. And then that full moon, we have that pinnacle of success, the pinnacle of energy. You can use this again for divination. So that's typically where I do a lot of my tarot readings or when I want to work with spirits, that's when I'm going to be doing that type of work. And then again, through the waning phase. This is where I'm going to be relaxing, resting, releasing things that no longer serve me. And then that dark moon period is when I am banishing. So I hope that that little quick routine of kind of what I do on a monthly basis is helpful for you when it comes to lunar magic. Another thing I wanted to say on this subject of moon magic is that some people like to consider what zodiac sign that the moon is in, just like how I talked about previously, the sun can be in a particular zodiac sign and that, that would be the season that we're in, right? But the moon sign changes about every few days or so, it just depends. But some people would like to time that as well. So if you have a moon, that is in a waxing phase and it's an Aries, you've really got that push, that forward momentum to just go after and manifest what you want. So if you're into astrology, you're into the zodiac signs, definitely look further into that. Consider what zodiac sign the moon may be in because that does add a little extra spiritual component to the energy of that moon. I actually have two books that I would like to recommend if you are interested in lunar magic. I have moon magic here and then moon spells, both by the same person. This is the one I recommend starting with. I think this is the first book that she wrote. It goes more in depth into the moon phases and how to use them in your spell work. But this is Moon Magic, Your Complete Guide to Harnessing the Mystical Energy of the Moon by Diane Alquist. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. But, uh, and then she came out with this book as well, Moon Spells, which has a lot more like spells and rituals that you can use for specific moon phases. But if you're looking at getting into lunar magic, I definitely recommend starting with this one. And then if you like this type of magic, then invest in this book as well for the additional spells and rituals that you can do. Next, let's talk about planetary magic. This is a huge subject, and I've actually already done a planetary magic series with the astrology Molly Victoria. In episode one, we discussed the seven traditional planets, just introducing the archetypes. And then in episode two, we talked about how to invoke those energies into your spells and rituals. So I'm going to link both episodes down below if you're interested in watching that, because this video is just going to be a brief overview. I'm not going to do a deep dive because it's such a big topic. But because we're talking about magical timings and timing your spell work, it might be important for you to consider the day of the week and also the time of the day, especially if you're going to start getting into planetary magic. This moves beyond the moon sign. Now we're talking about the seven traditional planets. So you've got the two luminaries, the sun and the moon, and then you have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. And this is also where you start to dip your toes in a little bit of ceremonial magic as well, because some people do quite literally like to wait for the stars to align for specific spells and rituals to take place. Now you obviously don't have to go all out. I love going all out because it's really fun to me, but that's not fun for everybody. So instead of trying to figure out the planets and how they're facing and where they are in the sky and the energy that's affecting us and all that, if that's too overwhelming for you, what you can do is just look at the days of the week. Monday is ruled by the moon. So if you're going to do some lunar work, let's say you're doing, you know, some moon magic, you really want to harness the energy of the new moon or the full moon or the waning or whatever it is. And then it's on a Monday as well. You've got that extra correspondence in there because Monday Day is ruled by the moon. And the moon itself is just great for magic. It's great for connecting to your psychic abilities, your subconscious. It's great for connecting to your inner self, your emotions. There are so many different things that the moon can actually be used for. And then we move into Tuesday, which Tuesday is ruled by Mars, which is the planet of drive, 
action, temperament. It is that push forward of energy. It is your motivation. So let's say, for example, you are doing a weight loss spell and you need to do a spell to get yourself up off the sofa. Let's say you're having a lack of motivation issue and you want to cast a spell to help increase your motivation so that you can achieve your weight loss goals. Working with Mars would be excellent in this regard. Or let's say you want to get a job. You really want to get a job, but you're, you do not have the motivation to go search for jobs, to do the interviews, to do whatever. And if you're wanting to get that motivation, try performing your spell work on a Tuesday to help increase that Martian energy, which is going to give you more drive, more oomph, more energy, more motivation. Moving into Wednesday, Wednesday is ruled by Mercury, which is all about the mind, the intellect, the mental space. It's all about communication and technology. So if you are casting a spell, let's say for example, let, let me take myself as an example. If I want to cast a spell for my YouTube channel, I would probably do that on a Wednesday because Wednesday is ruled by Mercury and Mercury rules the mind, communication, information technology, all of that stuff. So if I'm, you know, on a talking platform on technology, talking to a box and you're hearing me through a box, I'm going to want to harness Mercury for that. Or let's say, for example, you need to do a spell to better the communication between you and your partner. Let's say you and your partner are having a really difficult time right now. You aren't seeing eye to eye. You just cannot understand why they would think a certain way. There's just a disconnect there. If you want to do some sort of communication spell, definitely try doing that on Wednesday so you can work with that Mercury energy a little bit better. And then moving to Thursday. So Thursday is ruled by Jupiter, which is all about expansion. It's all about good luck, good fortune. It is just a lovely energy. Jupiter is one of my favorite planets. I do all of my money workings on Thursdays. So I have a money bowl. It's the first video that I ever did on this channel actually. So I'll link it down below if you're interested in money bowls, but I have this money bowl and I give offerings to it every single week. And I do those offerings on Thursday because I want to harness the good luck, the good fortune, the expansion. I want to expand the amount of money that I have. I want to expand my prosperity, you know, the opportunities coming to me. It is a very opportunistic planet to work with. So if you're doing any type of money or prosperity spell or just an abundance spell in general, Thursday is going to be a great day to do that because it's ruled by the expansive Jupiter. And then we move to Friday, which is ruled by Venus. And Venus actually rules over a lot more than people think. Most people think of Venus ruling over love, beauty and relationships and aesthetics and values sometimes, but people don't actually realize that she also rules over finances and the home as well. So Fridays are a great day for money spells as well, not just Thursdays, but Thursdays and Fridays. But if you want to do a love spell, an attraction spell, a spell to help improve your relationship, if you want to do some glamour magic or whatever that is, those are all spells that would be excellent to do on a Friday so you can work with that energy of Venus. And moving to Saturday, Saturday is ruled by Saturn, which is all about structure. It is about the law. It's about creating boundaries and enforcing boundaries. So if you have spells that revolve around legal matters, or you need justice for a particular situation, or you need to set better boundaries with people, or maybe you just need a little bit more discipline, Saturn's going to be a great planet to work with. And Saturn gets a bad reputation of being this really harsh planet, but I personally think Saturn is the best to work with when it comes to protection. And I know a lot of people that practice planetary magic feel the same way. And so it's really not all bad. Saturn is not scary. I use Saturn for pretty much all of my protection spells. I'm either using Saturn when I'm making sigils through planetary grids, or I'm doing my protection spells on Saturday to bring in that Saturnian influence. And then moving to Sunday, Sunday is ruled by the sun, which is all about life ego, friendships, vitality. I personally love doing any sort of spell or ritual that involves health on a Sunday because we all need the sun to thrive. The sun is the life bringer. It is extremely healing. And so you could probably do a healing spell, you know, on a couple other days of the week as well. But I particularly love Sundays for healing spells when you're working with the sun. Or if you needed to do a friendship spell or something, Sunday would be a great day to do that. Just any 
anything that revolves around the sun, obviously. And I'm going to recommend a couple books to you as well. I've already gone through quite a bit of book recommendations in my Planetary Magic series, so I'm not going to go through all of those books in this video, but I did want to give you at least a couple to start out with. I really, really love this book. It's called Practical Planetary Magic, Working the Magic of the classical planets in Western mystery tradition. Whoa, why was I having such a hard time saying that? <laughs> By David Rankine and Sarita de Este. So this is my favorite book for beginners uh, getting into planetary magic. I think this is a great place to start. The information is excellent and it's not too thick, so you're not super overwhelmed. But if you're a little bit more of an intermediate to where you're at least familiar with what the seven traditional planets are, then I recommend getting this Planetary Spells and Rituals, Practicing Dark and Light magic aligned with the cosmic bodies by Raven Digitalis. I loved this book because it has a ton of spells and rituals in it. So if you're past the point where you kind of already know what the planets represent and you just want more ideas or inspiration on the actual rituals that you can do with these planets, this is the book to go for because it just had an abundance of rituals that you can do. I really loved it. And actually, you know what, let me recommend a third book to you really quick. This is if you want to get super ceremonial and dive into the deep end of more advanced aspects of planetary magic. This book is Planetary Magic by Denning and Phillips. This gets into a lot more of the invoking and directing the powers of the planets. You get some Kabbalah or Kabbalah in there as well. So this book is for somebody who is really wanting to get ceremonial and become a lot more advanced with their planetary magic. Now that we've covered the seasons and kind of the bigger aspects of timing when we look at the entire wheel of the year. We've also talked about some lunar magic. We've talked about planetary magic and considering the placements of the cosmos above. Let's talk about specific times of the day. And this is not just as it pertains to planetary magic. So I'm kind of making this its own little section. But within planetary magic, there is a construct of planetary hours. So not only do you have certain days of the week that correspond to specific planets, you have specific points points in the day that correspond to specific planets. And this changes throughout the year because it depends on when dawn and dusk is in your area. And obviously dawn and dusk, that time shifts as we go through the whole wheel of the year. So you can calculate it yourself. Uh, the planetary magic books that I recommended to you do talk about that a little bit. But honestly, if you just went on Google and typed in planetary hour calculator, there's like a million that pop right up and it makes it so much easier but you have like hour one of the day is dedicated to a specific planet. Hour two of the day is dedicated to another planet and so on and so forth. So if you really started to get more ceremonial in your practice and you wanted to, let's say, work with Jupiter, what you would do is you would perform your ritual on a Thursday, which is ruled by Jupiter. And then you would also go and look up the planetary hour for Jupiter and say, okay, this is at 6 a.m. or 12 p.m or whatever it is. I don't have them memorized off the top of my head. I can't remember which one goes first, but you would find the planetary hour that corresponds with that planet and then do your spell working during that time frame. And then if you get even more ceremonial, what you do is you actually wait for Jupiter to be in a specific position in the sky that correlates with your intention as well. So it can get really, really complicated. I do a lot of, like if I'm doing some quick magic, it doesn't really matter and I just do it whenever I need it. But if I'm going to do a big, long, elaborate ritual, I am planning that like months in advance because I am seeing where the planets are going. <laughs> I want to do it during a time frame that really works up works out for me. I really like to align my spell work with the stars. And again, not everybody likes to do that. So you don't have to go that crazy. But you've got planetary hours throughout the day. And then you also have times of the day that just have some extra spiritual significance. So I mentioned liminal spaces in the beginning of this video, but I didn't really dive too deep into it. So liminal spaces, the word liminal derives from the Latin word limens, which means threshold. It is essentially this time and space where you are in transition from one thing to another. And because you are in transition, it is said that you are between the worlds. You're not just in the physical mundane world. You're not just in the astral world or in the fourth dimension or whatever you believe in. You're in both. You're kind of between the worlds and in both worlds at the same time. So liminal spaces can be anything. They can be times of day. They can be seasons like I talked about with, you know, springtime and fall time. They can even 
even be a like an actual physical threshold like a doorway or a crossroad you know if you have an intersection or something that could be considered a liminal space so there's a lot of different things that could be considered that but when we're considering the time of day dawn and dusk is also considered to be liminal spaces so dawn is that point where we're just coming out of nighttime moving into the daytime and then obviously dusk is where we're moving from the daytime to the nighttime so you can harness the powers if you don't want to go hardcore and do you know planetary magic with planetary hours and calculating that and all that what you can do is work with these times of day like dawn and dusk and that is supposed to help you get into that space of being between the worlds which is really what we want for spell work right because you want to get out of your conscious mind and slip into your subconscious mind or anything beyond your subconscious mind right I've talked about that a lot in my videos before is that you really want to get out of the physical mundane world and into a more spiritual space. And so doing your spell work during these times of dawn and dusk or seasonally or whatever, but doing your spell work in these liminal spaces is supposed to help you enter that altered state of consciousness a little bit better, being between the worlds and whatnot. So dawn and dusk is definitely something to consider. Also, you might want to consider daytime versus nighttime. Obviously, there's going to be different spells that correspond with each one of those as well. During the day, especially right at noon, you are at that pinnacle of success. You're working with a lot of sun energy even if you don't necessarily live in a very sunny area. I live in a super cloudy, rainy area. We hardly ever see the sun, but even still, noon for me is very much about sun energy. It's very much about building things, celebrating things, moving towards your goals, achieving, manifesting, all of those, you know, pushing forward actions, whereas the nighttime is more of that rest, that reflection, the subconscious mind. You're going into your psychic abilities a little bit better. You're potentially lucid dreaming. You know, you can do divination during the nighttime. Or like if you wanted to do a spell to enhance your psychic abilities, you might want to consider doing that at night instead of at high noon in the blazing sun. It might work out a little bit better for you. So I hope this video has been helpful. We went over seasons, we went over lunar magic, we went over planetary magic. We talked about different times of the day. We talked about liminal spaces just briefly. Let me know your favorite times to do spell work in the comments below. And also if you have any other inspiration, I am here to learn alongside you. I love hearing everyone's ideas and tips and tricks and just little golden nuggets here and there. I really love that we can share that kind of stuff. So feel free to add your own advice in the comments below if there's something that I haven't covered in this video. But thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you in another video very soon. Bye.